Ah, uh, Dece- wait, it's December already? How'd that happen? And we're all still mask-wearing virtual shut-ins? What kind of garbage year is this? Man, we've had enough of this year, and enough has been too much. Now that the end of it's here, it's time to clean house, air things out, get rid of all the junk from the previous 12 months, and get ready for the next, and we're sure much better, year. Definitely much better. We're sure of it. Somehow. When it comes to end-of-year tidying up, no place needs it more than the magnificent castle that is the GM Word of the Week Winter Fortress. As you may remember from last week's episode, we have a lot of things laying around that still need our attention. Most of them are words, though there are a few old cheese sandwiches now working out how to colonize Mars. Not to worry, though, we'll be focusing on the words for this episode. But do rest assured, if the sandwiches work out how to do the Mars thing, we'll let you in on the IPO. In any case, we have boxes of words piled up to the ceiling, and it's at about time they got some attention. They come to us, as you no doubt know, from our listeners and supporters, and get added to lists we supplied to ourselves from our media consumption and day-to-day -day lives. And as you also no doubt recall, some get used right away, while others have to wait their turn, either for combining with other related words, or just the fullness of time. What this means, in either case, is that we have stacks of words just laying around doing nothing, taking up space and contributing not at all to the general well-being of the joint, which is, we're sure you'll agree, very rude indeed. So it's time to set them to work. Time to get these words up and active and carrying their own weight. Maybe shine them up a bit and get them out the door doing something useful instead of leaving half-eaten cheese sandwiches laying around. And of course, the best vehicle for transporting unused words out into the open is a venerable device we've used no less than 14 times previously in the course of GM Word of the Week's vast catalog of episodes. A method so tried and true that even we are amazed at its effectiveness. It is, of course, The Lost Episode. A collection of bits of words and interesting information we've picked up along the way, both in the course of researching episodes you've already heard, and as listener submissions related to those episodes. But look, here's the thing. There are a lot of words. Like, a lot, a lot. And 2020 is nearly over. And we'd like to be reminded as little as possible about 2020 once it's over and done. No lingering reminders of the year that is soon to be was. The problem is, one lost episode just isn't going to clear the decks. Not all by itself. These words have to go. This year has to go. We don't want anything more to do with either of them. So there's only one solution we can see. One thing we can do to get them out for good. Two back-to-back -back lost episodes. That's right, two, this week and next. So here it is, the first of a two-pack of lost episodes. Lost episode 15A. Enjoy. This is GM Word of the Week. And I'm Fiddleback. Our first lost episode word, or rather pair of words, comes from all the way back in February of this year. You remember February, don't you? A time when faces roamed free and wild across the vast, verdant plains of social interaction and fun. Yes? No? Well, at any rate... Back in February, we released an episode about the Barbarian and how they were largely misunderstood because the Romans had a rather dim view of anyone who wouldn't wear a toga and wasn't interested in being ruled by the Romans. Part of the discussion revolved around the fact that the word Barbarian came from the Roman equivalent of the sort of word we use when referring to speech we either find boring or incomprehensible. Where we might mime a sock puppet and say blah blah blah, the Romans were doing the same thing, but saying bar 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 instead. We'd have called them blah blahians, the Romans called them barbarians. People who just talk and talk and talk and never say anything were interested in hearing. 
Well, the thing is, those kind of words, the barbarian kind, are called exonyms, which is derived from the Greek exo meaning outer and onoma meaning name, their outer name, or in other words, the name given to something or someone by people who are not part of that something or someone. In the case of barbarian, it was used by people who were outside the many groups and cultures that made up the so-called barbarians to refer to that group. It wasn't the name they used for themselves. And that's the acid test for this one. Is the name used to refer to people, places, or languages the same name used by those things themselves, or have they been given to them by outsiders? Now to be fair, there are a lot of reasons an exonym might get used to refer to someone. Yes, one of them is for the same reasons the Romans called almost everyone not Roman a barbarian. It dehumanized them and made them easier to dislike and oppress, which, if you were Roman, was a handy thing to have happen. It made fighting them and conquering them that much more obvious and necessary to the average Roman citizen than would treating them as a real people with real cultures and traditions all their own. And then, of course, once you had conquered them, you could do them the great and magnificent favor of civilizing them. Or to call a spade a spade, making them more Roman by forcing them to take on Roman culture and traditions instead of their own. But there were and are other valid reasons for using exonyms. For instance, some cultures have a language for which certain sounds do not have equivalents in other languages, leading to unpronounceable names for important peoples and regions for those who do not speak their language. In order to ease this difficulty and give non-native speakers a name by which to refer to them, exonyms are created. Similarly, the way languages are structured and new words to that language are introduced often means that an exonym must be created that follows the language rules. So that a place called Londinium in Latin becomes London, which then becomes Londre for some, Londino for others, Londra for others still, along with about a dozen other exonymic variations, all of which are intended to be the city of London as rendered in a grammatically correct way in each relevant language. If you consider the case of Germany, you can see how dramatic the changes from the native word to the exonym can be. While the English-speaking world calls the country Germany, the French call it Alman, and most German people call it Deutschland. Yet another useful property of an exonym is neutrality. See, sometimes two very different groups of people occupy the same place, each of which have a different name for it in their respective cultures. And sometimes using the wrong name in the wrong place will quite literally get people up in arms, whether you intended to do so or not. Which is why a whole mess of trouble is avoided among French and Dutch speakers living in the capital of Belgium by spelling the name of the capital city B-R-U-S-S-E-L-S -S -S and pronouncing it Brussels. That being but one example. Oh, and the second word we happened upon? Well, the antonym of exonym is endonym, which means the name a group of people, places, or languages have for themselves. And isn't it odd that the key to sorting out which you should use, the endonym or the exonym, is encapsulated in the phrase, when in Rome, do as the Romans do. Back in July, we had occasion to talk about a number of important advancements made during the Middle Ages, a time many people considered to be without technological or intellectual advancement at all. So naturally, we took it upon ourselves to explain why that wasn't so. And among the things we used to illustrate the point was the development of the calendar. Now, many, many things have shown evidence of usage as a means of marking out the seasons and positions of the planets and so forth. Very basic, early calendar-like devices were reasonably competently made by practically any culture with enough open sky to pay attention to and people willing to pay attention to it. Once you learned to make the marks on the rocks in any one of several ways, you and your tribe could pretty reliably know that when the night sky looks like this, dink, dink, bash, then that means spring was coming and maybe we'd better head over to the hill land and see how many new baby animals there were for the eating. Or whatever. 
Having established that basic level of competence, and having a lot of story to tell about calendars and the subsequent development thereof, we didn't necessarily need to reinforce the point with further examples, which is why we skipped over the Nebra sky disk. Yes, it was very interesting, but it didn't affect the story of the modern calendar, which is where that episode was focused. Still, the Nebra, or possibly Nebra, sky disk is a fascinating piece of kit. But what sort of kit is it? Upon first hearing the name, you might be forgiven if, like us, you were immediately afraid of falling down some UFO-based rabbit hole. It certainly sounds like that sort of thing, doesn't it? But no, you can relax. The Nebra sky disk is nothing of the sort. At nearly 12 inches in diameter, it represents the first known human depiction of the cosmos. It's made of bronze inlaid with gold, and if all the dating is correct, it was created, or at least buried, somewhere in the mid-Bronze Age. It's absolutely a fascinating device whose purpose is not entirely clear. It may be for religious observance, although here's an archaeological secret. If archaeologists don't really know for sure what something was used for, they often like to say it was used in some ritual or other, which no one is quite clear on. Or it may be an early attempt at an astronomical instrument. No one really knows for sure, and until someone from about 1600 BCE turns up to tell us about it, we probably never will. What everyone does seem sure about is that the creation of the disk happened in four stages, as explained by German state archaeologist Harald Meller. Initially, the disk had 32 small round gold circles, a large circular plate, and a large crescent-shaped plate attached. The circular plate is interpreted as either the sun or the full moon, the crescent shape as the crescent moon, or possibly the sun or the moon undergoing eclipse, and the dots are stars, with a cluster of seven dots likely representing the Pleiades. At some later date, two arcs constructed from gold of a different origin as shown by its chemical impurities were added at opposite edges of the disk. To make space for these arcs, one small circle was moved from the left side toward the center of the disk, and two of the circles on the right were covered over, so that 30 remained visible. The two arcs span an angle of 82 degrees, correctly indicating the angle between the positions of sunset at summer and winter solstice at the latitude 51 degrees north. Given that the arcs relate to solar phenomena, it is likely the circular plate represents the sun and not the moon. The final addition was another arc at the bottom, the sunboat, again made of gold from a different origin. And by the time the disc was buried, it also had 39 holes punched out around its perimeter, each approximately 3 millimeters in diameter. We'd include a handy picture, but the German government is pretty touchy about how that picture gets used. The disc was discovered, unfortunately, by a couple of German treasure hunters in 1999, we say, unfortunately, because these two were not behaving as well as they should have. While out metal detecting, they discovered the disc and, contrary to their local laws and requirements, did not notify the state of their find. Instead, they returned to the site the next day, dug up the disc which they damaged in the process, and immediately sold it and the rest of the hoard found with it. For the disc and the various swords and other gear, they received the princely sum of 31,000 Deutschmarks. Two years later, the disc was being sold around Germany for at least a million Deutschmarks when the police finally caught up with it and backtracked everything to the original finders. Everything is now safely held in a museum, and the two geniuses were given sentences of four and ten months each, which they disagreed with, so they appealed. And so sympathetic was the German court that they tacked on another two months to both of them just for the annoyance of it all. The final story we have for this volume of the Lost episode is the one about the shortest president in the world. We're not entirely certain where we came across this particular tidbit of information. Possibly it was during our research on the Resolute desk. Possibly not. We're just not sure. The story, however, starts in Mexico. See, around the turn of the 20th century, it is not unfair to say that Mexico was a mess. In the early 1800s, Mexico decided that it had had enough of the 300 years or so of Spanish rule 
and the thing to do was have a revolution, much like the Americans and the French had. It was basically what you did if you wanted a chance to run yourself, and Mexico did. So in 1810, they had a go at tossing Spain out on its ear. It took a while, but finally in 1823, under the leadership of General Antonio Santa Anna, they overthrew the Spanish government. The next year, the successful revolutionaries declared the new nation to be the United Mexican States, and a constitution was set up that mirrored, in many important ways, the Constitution of the United States of America. And then everyone lived happily ever after. Except not. And here we are going to vastly simplify a number of historical events that have shaped the politics and history of Mexico into what they are today. Because we're not a three hour long show, even at the best of times. Unfortunately, the newly declared Federal Republic wasn't the most stable national entity ever. And as has been observed before by better writers than us, revolutions have a habit of coming around again. It's in the name. And sure enough, the first president was swiftly followed into presidential office by the second president, who didn't like the fact that he lost the elections of 1828 and decided a coup would do in lieu. He was then counter-cooed by the next president in 1830, who was then overthrown by Santa Ana himself. He declared that General Manuel Pedraza was the actual president since he was the one who really won the 1828 election, and it's only 1832 and we're four presidents deep. Fortunately, Santa Ana fixed the whole problem by becoming the fifth president in 1832, a position he would hold a further 11 times over the subsequent years, during which time he would preside over a number of military conflicts and lose Texas to the U.S. in the Mexican-American War. Again, we're really simplifying things here, but you go look at the list of Mexican heads of state and see what you can make of it. Anyway, by 1854, Santa Ana's political career is done when he sells the Gadsden Strip to the U.S. so they can build a railroad. He pulls an amazing magic trick that makes all $10 million he got for the land disappear into his own coffers instead of Mexico's which upsets nearly everyone and allows the liberals to take over. They start reforming the place in 1855, and then everyone lives happily ever after. Except not. In what came to be called the Second Mexican Empire, the liberals set up a new constitution which empowered them and began enacting and implementing their own ideology in a series of separate laws, all of which threw Mexico into another 20-year-long civil war and established a new monarchy. They import an Austrian named Maximilian and set him up as emperor. Which is fine until they get tired of him and execute him in 1867, at which point they decide to try peace for a bit and restore the republic. Benito Juarez takes on the role of president and does okay until he dies one year into a second term that some folks think he never should have had. The head of the Mexican Senate, Sebastian Lerdo de Tejeda, is appointed to finish the now vacant term. And then everyone lives happily ever after. Except not. At the end of the term to which he was appointed, Lerdo runs for re-election, which turns out to be a big no-no. The people were tired, thanks to Santa Ana, of presidents having multiple terms, not that many had, and thought that it only led inevitably to corruption. Where the general public had been disappointed that the previous president had run twice, they were mostly mollified when he died a year into his second term. Lerdo, on the other hand, looked like he was going to stick around a while. When he wins, people really get their dander up, including the one person in the position to do something about it. Porfirio Diaz, one of Lerdo's opponents in the election, immediately rebels, overthrows Lerdo, and takes over as president. His main reason for doing so? No re-elections. None. Even if you were appointed to the office, you should only have one term, regardless how long that term was. Period. End of sentence. They even make it a law. On a strong platform of no re-elections, you might wonder how it was that Porfirio was able to be president for the next 30 years or so, winning eight re-elections. Well, the answer is simple. Mostly, he cheated. And when he couldn't cheat because people were very much, but you said no re-elections and how are you still here? 
he allowed someone else to win the election for a term, a friend of his, of course, and then stepped right back into the office as if he'd never left. And then, the American Panic of 1908 hits, and suddenly Mexico isn't exporting as many resources, and then the peasantry is having to pay unbelievable prices for basic foodstuffs, and most problematic of all, Porfirio is still in charge, and doesn't look like he's going anywhere anytime soon. It's almost time for another revolution. And in 1910, Porfirio surprises everyone when he says he's not going to run for re-election. Suddenly, everyone throws their hat into the ring to be the next president, including a man named Francisco Madero, one of the richest people in Mexico. Except Porfirio changes his mind, gets all the votes, and the country comes to pieces around him. Zapata, Pancho Villa, and Orozco show up, have a revolution, and put Madero in office as president. And everyone lived happily ever after. Except not, everyone wants something different out of Madero, and it isn't long before everyone is dissatisfied with something about him or the way he is conducting business. And so, revolution. This time led by would-be next president Jose Victoriano Huerta. Except, except he's not the next president. He's the next but one president. Madero is out all right, but remember that the Constitution of the United Mexican States was based in part on the Constitution of the United States of America. And one of the things they share is a line of succession should something happen to the president. See, Huerta had to oust a lot of people all at once. And Mexico's line of succession was broken. The vice president was gone, as was the attorney general, as were a lot of other people. There was no one in line left to declare Huerta the official president. And this year, we've learned all about the appearance of legitimacy, which was what Huerta needed if he was going to run the country. He needed to appear legitimate for it all to work. Which is where Pedro Lascurain comes in. Lascurain is just foreign secretary. He's very far down the chain of succession and hardly consequential at all, at least from the outside. But as the people in front of him fall like dominoes, he becomes the president of Mexico. And Pedro Lascurain has but one job. Appoint Huerta to the position of interior secretary and then quit which he does. And then Huerta, now in the proper line of succession, becomes president. In all, it took somewhere between 15 and 45 minutes to do the job, making Pedro Lascurain the 34th president of Mexico, the shortest president in the history of the world. Thanks for listening to this episode of GM Word of the Week. And don't forget to listen next week for the second volume of Lost Episode 15. This show is supported by the very generous contributions of our patrons on Patreon. Through their efforts, they help keep fresh episodes coming out to you on a weekly basis. If you'd like to help keep episodes coming to your fellow listeners, head over to our support page on gmwordoftheweek.com or click the yellow banner at the top of any page inside. Even a $1 contribution makes a difference, and we're happy to have you on board, no matter how much you contribute. This episode was researched, written, and produced by Brian. Don't call me late for dinner, Casey. Music was provided by Blue Dot Sessions. Gosh, I hope you weren't expecting a quote here. <laughs>